Welcome to Mostly Minutia. I'm Colleen Lindell. This is episode eight, Killing It. Jane Duong was in the middle of her first year of grad school at Cal State Long Beach when she decided to give online dating a try. Hours were long. She was in school about 40 hours a week, and she also had a full-time job working as coordinator on campus at the Suicide Prevention Center. Between the two, she was strapped for time, and despite her pride, she decided to register with OkCupid. She went on a few dates, but felt they were moving too fast. She was looking for a spiritual connection and felt most people wanted a physical connection first. To be fair, Jane's profile did say straight up she was looking for a man like Jesus, Carpenter's son. And with that, she decided to extend her radius out to Jerusalem. And that's when she met Chris. We begin this story with Jane's backstory. And a quick note, you will notice halfway through this episode that Jane's audio changes. Apparently, whilst recording, there was a power surge and it created a sort of buzz. I couldn't hear it in the headphones at the time. I managed to doctor it up a little bit in Pro Tools, but nonetheless, you will notice a change and I'm very, very sorry for that. I just felt I needed to be upfront. And now, here's Jane. My name is Jane Duong Killer, and I was raised in Orange County in the Garden Grove area, but I was born in downtown LA. Growing up consisted of my mom and my two younger brothers. My brother Jimmy um, was born with cerebral palsy, so um, he's paralyzed from the chest down, and he's very smart, funny, bright, a real jokester. People are really happy when they're around him. And then Jason, he's my youngest brother, and he currently goes to school in at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. He's never seen snow before that, so I'd say he's pretty gutsy. Uh, I played a parental figure at a very young age. I felt like I was the person who had to make sure things ran smoothly and that everything was okay and that everyone was all right and it developed into very strong characteristics of mine that I currently also practice looking after others, making sure that things are okay, everything's running well. My mom's name is Nina, that's the American name that she picked when she received citizenship but her um, Vietnamese name is, it's pronounced Ngoc Yung. She migrated here from Vietnam after the war when she was, I think, 16 or 17. Although she was born in Vietnam, she was raised in a city that was predominantly Chinese, and she is genetically Chinese, culturally Vietnamese, and that's kind of how I refer to myself too. Well, I grew up learning about God, um, knowing who God is. And he sounded like a very scary person who saw everything and would punish you if you ever did something bad. Um, It wasn't until I was in my early 20s where I learned about Jesus. And how that happened was I met this boy in chemistry class and he asked me if I was Catholic and I thought that was just a really weird question. Uh, One day he asked me to go to one of his youth group meetings and ever since then I met this group of young adults that were just very passionate about Jesus and learning about the Bible because my ancestors, uh, my relatives are predominantly Buddhist so I never really knew much about Jesus. So on my own with this youth group, I grew a lot. I learned how to pray, I I learned about the stories of Jesus, and my life started to make sense and like why certain things happened and, and what strengths I gained from it. And growing up, you know, without a paternal figure was um difficult. So my my journey through life felt less alone as I learned that Jesus has been by my side. Um, have you ever seen an angel? I haven't, but um, this is a pretty serious story, but I'd, I'd like to share it. Um, when I was younger, I think I was in sixth grade, my mom, you know, being a single mom um, and having 
to look after three kids and one that had a severe disability that required a lot of care. She hit depression and had thoughts of suicide and she had plans to end her life. In our house, we had a, a firearm and that was because we've been robbed before so my mom wanted to protect us. Um, the firearm was locked in a box. It was like three in the morning or so and for my mom to wake me up for school each morning was very difficult. But somehow, three in the morning that day, my eyes opened up and I heard a man's voice say, get up and run outside. And I just opened my eyes, but all of a sudden I felt this, um, this energy pull me out of bed. So I just shot up and I saw my mom trying to attempt to open the, the box with the firearm and she had called the police telling them to come and to look after her children because she was going to end her life. She was in the kitchen, she turned around and she saw me just wide awake running after her and like pushing her away from the firearm. I kept pushing, pushing, and then I sat on her and I was just yelling, screaming at her, and then the police came. They took her to get treatment and, and seek help, but when I went to visit her, she asked me, well, what I was doing so wide awake during that time and I said I don't know someone just woke me up and told me to run out, out in the living room she was telling me that she was struggling with opening that box because it had a lock on it but the divine thing was the key to the lock I was wearing it around my neck two weeks prior it felt like every single day I had this dream that I needed to find a key, a key to something. So whenever my mom left the house, I'd tear down the house every time trying to look for this key because I kept dreaming about it and it was a, a real dream. I tried looking everywhere and I couldn't find the key. And then one day I tore apart the um, ki kitchen cabinets and I saw a little nail inside the cabinet and hung on the nail was this one key. So that's what I did. I took the key and I tied a rope around it and I just wore it with me to school every day. And I just, yeah, kept it near me. What did your, did your dating life look like before you met Chris? I think I didn't date for like five years or so because I was just so on fire and fulfilled with God's love that I just, I was just so content and happy with my life. I didn't really have an ideal image of what marriage is supposed to be like, but I had hopes that I would find someone. Even though I didn't know what that looked like, I had hope in my heart that I would find something pretty spectacular. In grad school, a lot of the girls um, in the program, you know, we're like, oh, grad school is really keeping us busy. We're, we're not meeting. We don't have time to meet people. And one of them said, well, I'm trying online dating. And like my my younger self would have been like, ha, huh, online dating. That's no. I'm just going to find my future spouse. Like we're going to run into each other at the grocery store in the produce section. Like an apple's going to roll down and I'm going to bump heads as we both try and pick it up and be like, oh, hello. And so I, I was curious. I was like, let's see what this online dating is all about. And so I created a profile. I didn't tell anybody though, because I was still embarrassed that I was doing online dating. And it was just, yeah, I found the love of my life on the most secular website, OkCupid. So OkCupid, you register, it's a free site which was partly what drew me to it, and you answer questions, hundreds of questions, as many as you want. For every person on there, it has a percentage match. What was Jane? I think she was 93% or something. Actually, my profile is pretty intense. It was like, you know, straight up, looking for a man like Jesus, Carpenter's son with like, yeah, I was pretty serious because I, I thought like, okay, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to find someone who resembles Jesus. Where was Jesus born? Jerusalem. So then I put my, my profile setting for like 500 miles from Jerusalem. Silly me. I got this 
this whole thing where I thought I was going to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and meet up with my future husband and things like that. You know, the profiles that came in, they were all uh, mostly Middle Eastern guys, and their profiles were in Hebrew, so I couldn't even understand what I was reading. I did message a couple of them, and back and forth, it was like in broken English sentences. I was like, hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. And then I saw Chris's profile, and it was in English, and I understood it. And I thought, okay, let's read up on this. It's so funny, because he had lots of pictures up, but he looked different in each picture, so I had no idea like which one actually resembled him. His profile picture, which looks great, was like 10 years old. So he's a little trickster. <laughs> My name is Chris Killer. Apparently hundreds of years ago, the name Killer used to be known as Kill Hair. I remember about 10 years ago, I Googled my name, Christopher James Killer, and I found there was a guy near Toronto who had exactly the same name as me. So I emailed him and said, you've got the same name as me. And just randomly, within an, a couple of weeks of that, a guy from Australia emailed me saying, you've got the same name as me. And um, it turned out that I, was, I just happened to be going to Australia a few months after that. So I actually met, met up with him for no reason other than why not. He just got married and his wife was really cute. So I thought that's encouraging for people with names like mine. I'm from Blandford in Dorset. Blandford Forum is the full name, but everyone calls it Blandford. I have one sister two years younger than me and um, my parents are both teachers. My mum's family, they come from like 20 miles away and they're farmers. So every so often we used to visit them and go around the farm on the Land Rover. It was a dairy and arable farm, so we used to feed the cows. It was a fond memory from my childhood. There was an idea in Blandford that there's a big world out there somewhere, but it's separated from us. And only since living elsewhere and experiencing other cultures have I come to see what Blandford, what is unique about Blandford and what it hasn't got and has got. I went from being kind of the cleverest kid in the school in Blandford to being one of the worst in the class at Bath University. The University of Bath is where I went to university studying mechanical engineering. I kind of always knew that I was going to go to university to do something. I was, I was fairly good at academic stuff at school and Science and maths was what I was good at. It was just a choice of, do I like maths or physics or engineering? Yeah, I grew up Christian. I, um, I've i always gone to church. Started off going to, I suppose, an evangelical church. Then, in I think 96 or something, my mum started going to a different church, whereas my dad stayed at the same one. And um, I followed my mum to this new church and had a different culture. People were noticeably friendlier. It was around that time I had to go to hospital where they first detected that I had some sort of brain tumour. The people at my new church, who I had only met maybe twice, they all sent me a uh, Get Well Soon card. I even remember a girl called Sally, who I'd only met once, sent me a card just on her own. The reason it wasn't operated on back then was because people prayed for me and all the symptoms went away. It didn't completely vanish because the symptoms came back because it was still there. One awkward thing at that time was a, I, I kind of had a, an enemy. It was basically this guy that didn't like me. And unfortunately, he was at the same church as me and doing the same classes as me at school. In fact, he was the only person doing all exactly the same classes as me at school. It was really bad luck. And because he was quite influential socially, he kind of made everyone else turn against me too. So that last couple of years in Blandford was a bit lonely for me. Though that story kind of had a nice conclusion. I went back to Blandford 
three, I think, five years after I left. And I went down the local pub and uh, he was there. In fact, all the people from my A-level physics class just happened to be in the pub at the same time. And out of the blue, he apologised for being so nasty to me during that time. And I was just like, oh, don't worry. I, I was over it ages ago. And uh, I said, give me a hug. So he did. I had two serious girlfriends before I met Jane, who I'm now married to. Yeah, the first one was amazing. It was a real dream come true. It was brilliant for about a year. And then there are a few issues towards the end. I think it was just we weren't good enough at communicating to each other and we didn't know ourselves well enough. I was 20 when I met her. I'm really glad I didn't marry her, even though I did propose at one point. In... 2011 I think I moved out of Bath and moved back in with my parents this was to finish writing up my PhD thesis I applied for a job building a human powered airplane so then I moved up closer to where the job was based in a little place on my own it was kind of a shed in the middle of nowhere it was the first time and I expect last time I'll ever live on my own it was out in the country and I used to cycle to work on a, a road with just one lane. And it was a really interesting job too. Terrible pay, but really interesting. That was the context of my life when I met Jane. This girl visited my profile and she was really beautiful. I sent her a message, she sent me a message. She was from Austin, Texas, and she was the first girl I'd met online who I thought, you know, this is my kind of woman. And we had a Skype chat after that. It seemed to go kind of well. And we had another one after that, and that wasn't quite so flowy. I could see she was kind of losing interest a little bit. It kind of fizzled out, basically. And it was about three months after that that Jane messaged me. I remember at the time, there was another girl who I was trying to pursue. She was actually a lingerie model. She looked amazing in her photos and uh, we were kind of chatting a little bit. At that moment Jane came along and wrote me a message and I couldn't help but like give Jane a whole load of respect. I just thought she's a cool person. I've got to reply to her. I've got to show her the respect she's given me. It'd be rude not to. Some things that stood out to me were the section where it says what others say about me and he put something like, doesn't say much, is quiet, but thinks for himself. And then one of the questions asked, how many times do you brush your teeth a day? And he said, once a day. And he says, but that might change if my mouth is to become a part of someone else's life. And I thought that was pretty funny. But the thing is, he, like, sometimes he still brushes his teeth only once a day. <laughs> an email exchange built up between Jane and I and I kind of thought oh I'm gonna to have to choose one or the other here and I thought is this actually going anywhere with this hot girl from London and I chose Jane out of the two just because I knew what she was really like I liked her I got on with her I respected her but I didn't really know this other girl. I just like looking at pictures of her. We had a Skype conversation. It lasted three hours. At once, I just knew this is really going places. She was as serious about me as I was about her. And it wasn't like us talking about nothing. It was us talking about everything. And being really honest and genuine with each other and having oh, amazing conversations about serious topics and, and deep topics on our first Skype conversation. And so for someone to be able to just start that off right away on the first time meeting was very attractive. What were your thoughts when you found out that his last name was Killer? Oh my gosh! That happened when um, on our first Skype conversation when we decided to uh, meet up. On his um, account it said Chris Killer. And I thought, maybe it's a nickname or something. And so during the Skype conversation, I also asked him, I said, 
by any chance is your last name Killer? And he looks straight at the camera and he says, I'm afraid so. And I thought, holy crud. Because I'm doing like college mental health and suicide prevention, I started to hear the jokes coming. My name is Jane Killer. I'm here to prevent suicides on a college campus. Probably a week or two after that, she said, I'm very busy, but I do have a week free in about two months. Just letting you know, really. Didn't promise her anything, of course. So I thought about it and thought, what am I doing that week? Could I really go out there to see her? That reminds me of a funny story. There was one time, like, we were, we've been talking and we were pretty serious about it. And um, one time I was on OkCupid at the same time Chris was. And I thought, like, ah, oh, we're both still browsing on here, aren't we? And so I sent him a message, some, something like, fancy seeing you on here. And he goes, oh no, I was looking at your profile to make sure that, like, the things that um, you said and, and things like that. I'm like, I'm not asking you what you're doing on OkCupid at the same time as me. I'm just saying it's interesting seeing you on here. Like, how does it feel? You know, I'm still browsing and I know you're still browsing. It was just really funny because then I think we, we had to decide whether or not this our relationship was serious enough to, I guess, close our account. And then one day, Chris decides to make it exclusive and ask me to be his girlfriend through Skype. He said, and we've never even met in person yet, but he goes, will you be my girlfriend? And I said, I said yes. Well, I mentioned Jane said fairly early on, I've got a free week in May, but I'm busy for months and months after that. So I thought about it and thought, it's a good thing to do. I'm going to go over there and we're going to hang out. And if it doesn't work out, well, it's a week or so of kind of awkwardness, but it's an interesting life experience and I'm all for that sort of thing. I thought to myself, if this girl is exactly how I think she is, it's possible that I could propose this week. I couldn't see her anywhere at the airport. She'd kind of gone to the wrong terminal and I was kind of nervous that she'd change her mind or something. But then she turned up and uh, we kind of hugged a bit. And um, my first thought, I vocalised it, perhaps I shouldn't have. I said, oh, wow, you're really Asian. I don't know why I said that really, it's a bit stupid. Other than his fingernails were really dirty, I was just really shocked to see him in 3D. Because it's kind of like talking to a computer screen the whole time you've known each other. So to see him at different angles was very interesting. And so we just stood there and stared at each other for like 10 minutes without saying anything. And we both felt this. We were looking into each other's eyes for several minutes. It was more than five minutes, maybe even 10 minutes. We were just kind of looking at each other. Like we'd got to know each other already, but it was a whole new experience a whole new dimension, literally, seeing another person in front of us who we'd never seen before, yet we felt we knew. Did you think that he was good looking? (laughs) Yeah, in his wrinkly old way. You mean in his face? Yeah. (laughs) But then it's crazy because when he arrived, like we'd, we'd take pictures every day of things that we were doing And his first picture, he looked wrinkly. And then as the days progressed with us hanging out, his face started looking younger and younger and younger. And even he noticed it too. He was like, I'm I'm getting younger in these pictures. And I was like, yeah, but I think he's very handsome. As I kind of mentioned earlier, I, I really respected Jane. Everything about her, I really appreciated the way... She treats people the way she lives her life, the way she makes decisions. I just liked everything about her. But the thing is, I've never seen anyone who looks like Jane. 
She's beautiful in a very unique way. I'd say I started falling in love with her before I came to visit. And uh, coming to visit confirmed that I wasn't wrong to do that. I think it was a week after we met in person. It was so intense. We were splashing around in near the Seal Beach Pier. And he goes, Jane? And he gets down on one knee and he goes, will you marry me? And I just, I was like, uh, yes, but after we meet your family, okay? <laughs> Her mum doesn't speak very good English, but she really liked me. Jane says that I was the first boy that she approved of. As it turned out, she's the one who I asked for Jane's hand in marriage. And she said, yeah. Jane kind of had to explain it to her because she didn't quite understand what I was saying. But she was like, yeah, 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 and had a smile on her face. He holds her hand and looks her in the eye and he goes, Mrs. Duong, I'd like to marry your daughter. And like she went on and on. She was just like, you know how many years it took me to raise her so that she could be the person she is today. All these years of hard work blood, sweat, and tears, and so she just went on this rant, and she finally said yes, you know. <laughs> At the end of the first trip, she said, oh, I'll probably be able to come in August or something, over the summer holiday, but she asked her work about it, and they just said no, and she broke the news to me, and I was kind of gutted, and I thought, oh no, how am I going to cope without seeing you for that long? In um, August... I went on a mountain bike holiday in the Alps. First time I'd done something that extreme and I had a new bike as well. I was eager to try it out on some really hardcore terrain. Anyway, I uh, crashed and I broke my pelvis. I kind of came to a halt all of a sudden when my hip smacked into a bit of rock. It cut me and blood was gushing out. The people who saw me said it was kind of pulsating out. If the blood flow hadn't been stopped, I'd have bled to death on the mountain. If I'd have been on my own, I wouldn't have been able to get myself down the mountain and I would have died. So I'm really grateful for Tom, Gary and Jerome, the guys I'd only met that week who I was riding with. I got airlifted out by helicopter, taken to Annecy Hospital in the south of France. Yeah, but that was really scary because, you know, we have our our um, very consistent Skype dates. The way it worked was um, we're eight hours ahead here than back in the UK. So when she was going to bed, she'd call me to wake me up. So she was my morning alarm clock, which was nice. And as she drifted off to sleep, I'd be gradually waking up. And it was like we did that every single day. So then... One day, he wasn't online, and I was just like, what's going on? And I was texting, I was sending him lots of, like, Facebook messages. And his friend, who was cycling with him, he sent me a message saying that Chris got in a very bad accident. And that's where I was, like, panicking, because I didn't know how I'd get to him. And they said I was not going to be able to walk for six weeks. So I thought, what am I going to do? I know. Or was it Jane? Oh my goodness, like, right after his surgery, um, he was flown from France back to England, and he stayed for, uh, in England for maybe a week or so after his surgery, and he goes to his family, he's like, I'm going to go see Jane. And they're like, don't be ridiculous. And the poor boy had, like, crutches going, sitting on this bus for, like, three hours to get to the airport, three or four hours, and all he had on was his little backpack. And then when I went to go pick him up, I was just like this cute little boy in like a wheelchair and two crutches and his backpack was all he had. And I was just so sweet. I came for like four weeks that time. That was a nice trip. Of course, this one was quite different to the first one. First one, we were both like on holiday. Every day we were kind of doing something together. Whereas this second trip, Jane and I got to know each other in a kind of normal workday sort of context. We'd already accepted that we were going to be together forever and we we're both comfortable with that. We we're already very close. But it was, it's good just to 
practice living together. It was really nice, but it wasn't like the first trip where we got to do lots of fun things. It was more like, you know, everyday things and like not really going out a lot, I don't think. Oh yeah, and then when he came to my mom's house in his crutches, she was pissed. She was yelling at him and screaming at him, like, why didn't you know any better to get in an accident? Or something like that, because she was just so hurt seeing him hurt. So I came over on crutches and was on a wheelchair going for the airport. Going back, I was just walking. I remember one of the airport staff said, uh, it says here on your ticket you're disabled. <laughs> I said, yeah, I used to be, but not anymore. Came back, went to work, and then I let my boss know, yeah, after Christmas, I'm going. I'm not coming back. I'm going to California. I'm going to marry Jane. She came over around 20th of December or something. She came to my workplace, the hands of the people I worked with, um, saw my little shack. She hated it. Her level of cleanliness is incredibly high, and mine back then wasn't so much. She met my family. She uh, became good friends with my sister. I loved meeting his sister. Yeah, she was just so welcoming and kind, and his parents are lovely. I'm glad they're my parents now. That's when I asked my parents for their approval to marry Jane, and I officially proposed and put a ring on her finger. It was on Christmas Day, in the family living room in front of the family. My dad, I think he, he kissed me or something, and that's the first time he's ever shown any emotion on anything, <laughs> almost. So it was decided that I was gonna come over here. But how are we gonna do it? Looking into the visa process, the kind of official way of doing it is you fill in the hundreds of forms whilst you're living in separate countries, and once they say, okay, you're allowed to have a visa, then one person moves over to be with the other. But it just seems horribly slow, and I just didn't want to do that. I thought there must be a, another way. And the other way of doing it, which is more of a high-risk approach, because if, if they reject it, I'm not sure if you're allowed to appeal, is um, you come over, you get married, and just stay there and... Um, you apply for a change of status once you're there. So that's what I decided to do. And thankfully, it all worked out. It was a small ceremony. My mom was a witness, and my godparents were also the other witnesses. It was just like five of us, but it was a very nice ceremony. My mom seemed really proud. It was a sensible decision to do that at that point. We weren't expecting it to be emotional or significant, but it actually was. For me, I was committing my life to someone. I was promising her that I'd love her forever. It was just a week or so after that I had a really bad headache. I remember muttering to Jane, perhaps I should have got health insurance. And um, a few hours later, in bed, I had a seizure. It's what's called a grand mal seizure. So I kind of totally passed out. My lips went blue, I think, and I kind of jerked my body around as if I was trying to breathe, but I couldn't. And uh, Jane called 911 straight away. Um, we made arrangements where when he moved here, he'd live with my godparents, and then we wouldn't live together until we were married. But that one night, we went out to eat with my friends, and I didn't want to take him back to my godparents because I just thought, like, oh, it's late already, I have to go. I have to go to work the next day, so just come back to my place and sleep there. And then right before he went to bed, he said, maybe I should buy insurance, um, health insurance, in case something happens. And I'm like, oh, we'll take care of that in the morning. And that morning, he has the seizure, so I'm like in regret, thinking like, why didn't we get the health insurance? Yeah, and that's when I really went full on trying to learn about legal documents and insurance and like, like adding your dependent and things like that. And all of a sudden, us like kind of being subtle about the fact that we got legally married became big. The thing was he had no social security number, he had no US ID or anything, it was just all British documents. And so 
like I was scared going up to HR. But before I went up, I prayed. I just prayed that like when we went up there, everything would be okay. The person who's helping me would be open-minded and understanding. And I went up there. All I had was my marriage license, and I said, my husband's in the hospital, and I need to put him on my medical plan as soon as possible. And then she takes it, and she goes, does he have a social security number? And I said, no. Does she have a driver's license? I said, no. I said, he's, he's not of this, he, he's not from this country. And then she looks at me, and she goes, that's all you have to say. And then all the paperwork she said before you date anything make sure you put it as february 1st 2015 and she said i'll just tell them that that we were backed up in paperwork and we finally came across yours but you signed it on the first so technically you're covered on the first even though i came on the ninth to do all this and i was like praise god praise god and they said yeah you're gonna have to have surgery you're going to have to have brain surgery. You're going to have to get this out. And um, Jane changed health insurance at least once so she could find the ideal person to operate on me. She um, did her undergraduate course in biochemistry. She, know, she wanted to be a doctor originally. She's exactly the right sort of person you want to look for a surgeon for you. I was very particular in who I wanted to him to do the surgery on him because it's a brain surgery it's serious but Chris is like uh you know I mean they're a doctor should be they know what they're doing so the first surgeon was at UCI Frank Sue he's like he's like the BMW surgeon like top notch on top of it currently a faculty member at UCI, still doing research, giving back to research, super active. But he doesn't take my insurance because it's not good enough. Because Dr. Sue didn't take our insurance, they referred us to um, another neurosurgeon. Like, I asked my questions and he said, like, he seemed a bit sexist where he's just like, are you sure you want to be married to her? Because I was really drilling him. I was drilling him big time. And then Chris says, he seems capable of doing the surgery. And I said, I'm not looking for capable. I'm looking for the best. This is your brain we're dealing with here. Okay? Because then him having his um, seizure was so scary. Because after the seizure, for 45 minutes, he couldn't speak. His speech was slurred. He didn't make sense. He like... I was afraid that was permanent, and I was just like, oh shoot, is this how our marriage is going to be? This is it? I even thought, like, is he going to make it? Because he was so blue in the face, he couldn't breathe, and he passed out, and it was just like, I was trying to talk to him, but he couldn't hear me. It was so scary. So, I did my research, and then I found this neurosurgeon that was like not Frank Sue but not my, the second one it was just right in the middle and I felt okay with him because he answered all my questions really well asked him how big the incision was brilliant he like cut it to the the hairline of like Chris's sideburns so when Chris's sideburns grow out you don't see the scar and after the surgery ridiculous Chris is in so much pain and he comes out and he says, that surgery was really serious. I said, why do you think I was freaking out this whole time trying to find the right surgeon for you? You were going to take anybody who could cut something to cut into your head. And he's just like, this is so serious. I'm in so much pain. I'm like, why do you think I'm freaking out? And he goes, I can't blink. My eyes drying out. I'm like, if you cannot blink and that's the least of your worries, we are in great shape. <laughs> How big was that tumor? It was about the size of a golf ball. And where was it living? Just above my left ear. I remember thinking, I've now got a hole in my head where that used to be. What could I replace it with? <laughs> <laughs> Did you think of anything? So there's a few ideas. Squashed flies, uh, jam, uh Maybe a i7 processor. 
you can work work out the software afterwards. <laughs> you know, my mom helped look after him um, for the first two weeks. So she she came over here and stayed with him, and she'd make sure he gets his exercise, and she'd like hold his hand and walk him around the block and things like that. Um, she took good care of him, so she helped out a lot with that. And yeah, I was still doing school full time, work school full time, and also wedding planning. That was really crazy. I don't know how I did it. And I just thought like, man, you know, he just m moved here for less than a month and we're just getting ready to learn about each other and build our relationship and for something big like that to happen and for for us to still stick it through and be together it's just like wow if we can take on this we're pretty solid nothing else is gonna like really break us down it it brought us closer together actually because um, the first few months of our marriage, maybe the first year of our marriage, I caused Jane lots of stress just through things that happened to me. That was probably the big one. And then there was the whole visa process, which it takes a lot of time and effort, hundreds of forms to fill in. You've got to get it exactly perfectly right. A lot of people hire a lawyer, but we decided just to do the homework ourselves read up on all the websites of how you should fill these forms in. Both of those things, we worked as a team and it worked out great for us. So it kind of encouraged us that we could we could take anything on. So, yeah, I praise God through it all. I can understand why this happened. Can you tell me about when you guys did finally get married? Once we decided to postpone our English wedding from 2014 to 2015, we then realised the American wedding was going to come first. That was always going to be the end of 2014. So my mum and sister came for almost three months. As I mentioned, there's like a 90-day limit for a tourist visa. It came for 80-something days. Yeah, in addition to my parents and my sister, a couple of friends of mine from England came over too. They got married just one week before us. Shout out to Cam and Vix. Uh, they had their honeymoon in Southern California. My sister made Jane's wedding dress, but she hadn't worked on it that much in England, uh, so she was working hard on that for the first few weeks. We got married on December the 27th, and the thing is it was quite stressful immediately before the wedding because I mentioned my sister was making a wedding dress. It still wasn't quite finished, even on the wedding day morning, so... Jane turned up at the church just in normal clothes whilst my sister was doing some final stitches. The original plan was to have some sort of run-through practice just before, but we didn't have time for that. It worked out great in the end. She looked fantastic. She never got to see herself in the mirror in her dress. So she just, all she could do was just put it on and walk in. But she looked fantastic and she was happy, I was happy. When I walked down the aisle, once the doors swung open and I walked down, I was just walking and I only took about like three steps and I started breaking down because everywhere I looked in that room, there was just love everywhere. Only made it up like one fourth of the way and I was just bawling, just crying, filled with so much joy. And it's just like the loving faces of everyone who, who looked at me. It was just pure love and pure happiness that I was seeing in people. And wow, to have Chris's mom, dad, and sister travel all the way from England to come out here. His parents have never been to America. Never. What ways are you and Chris different? Every way possible. We're, we're complete opposites. We have nothing in common. Yeah. But then... What brings us together and holds us together are our core values. We have very similar values. When I was looking for a, a husband, I wasn't looking for someone who could like show me the world or provide me with financial stability or things like that. I was looking for someone who would accept me as 
who I am and also accept my mom and my brother into our family. Yeah, so I found Chris who's willing to to be by my side through it all. Like, he's amazing. When I'm at work on Fridays, I'll ask him to pick up Jimmy and he does. He goes to the, the care facility that Jimmy l lives in, grabs his laptop, grabs his phone, grabs his walker, wheelchair, all that, drops by the nurse's station, picks up all the medication he needs for the week, and it's just anything I need help with, Chris does it with all his heart. In what ways are you and Jane different? Pretty much every way. I mentioned she's incredibly well organized. She's a great manager and multitasker, but if she can't solve a problem quickly, it really frustrates her. I'm the opposite of all of that. I find it very stressful if I'm being asked to do several things at once, but if I have a really hard problem, I like getting really into it and spending time solving it properly and really understanding what's going on. So we work very differently in that respect, but I think we're quite a good team because of that. She's a much nicer person than I am. <laughs> She's very good at making a good first impression like um, I'm having lots of job interviews and she's always giving me tips on what to say and also what to write in application letters to she she's good at giving me feedback on the way I come across whereas I just don't care so much <laughs> I'm kind of secure in myself and I'm going to let other people deal with that so I graduated just this May and in about two weeks, I'm going to England to have our English wedding. Because his friends and family weren't able to make it out, we're going to go back and fly to them and celebrate our third wedding. Lots of people joke about it. They're like, what? Your third marriage to the same person? And people are always asking me, like, how does Chris feel about being married three times? Is he, like, over it? No! Chris loves weddings. He loves weddings and he loves being married. It's really funny. Well, the big contrast between my old life and my new life has been I don't really have a social circle that I hang out with regularly anymore. I've just got one person who's right at the center of my life. And I always had like a group of close buddies I used to do stuff with. So I kind of miss that. Um, I sent them all an email saying, let's have a good uh, stag night when I go back. That's bachelor party in English. Um, what advice can you give or do you have to give for single men and single women? Well, I would say you don't get to your future through extrapolating from your past. It's non-linear. You know what extrapolation is, don't you? Imagine a graph. It's a straight line graph going up and you're halfway through the graph. Extrapolation says that the second half of the graph will just continue on that same line as the first half. And what I'm saying is you can't extrapolate. The future might go in a different direction. It doesn't go on a straight line. The graph has kinks in it. I know that there's the pressures of like, you know, especially as you get older, you see those around you getting into serious relationships, getting married, having a family and things like that. It's hard to, you know, not to compare yourself and like, you know, wonder where is Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright? Where are they? My advice is to continue living your life and doing what you're passionate about because that's when others are going to find you most attractive, when you're just full-on given passion and in, into what you're doing. But when you think about your spouse and, and you feel sad that you haven't met them yet, um, pray for them. Pray that whatever struggles they're experiencing, that you pray for some source of relief for them until the day that you arrive to help support and love them. And, you know, maybe there are still things about you that you need to learn and discover and explore about yourself and what 
you know, skills and talents you still haven't discovered yet and just focus on yourself and focus. Use that time to just discover and explore who you are and and find the best version of yourself because I think that when you're able to find the best version of yourself, when you do meet your future spouse, it's it's just going to be that much greater. You're, You're going to be able to love them in ways that you never dreamt possible because of the the different parts of you that you've discovered and learned about yourself. So during this time of, you know, um, singleness, just enjoy it. Live out your passion, pursue what makes you happy, and just be ambitious. And trust that, like, with your greatness and your uniqueness and, and your wonderfulness, there has to be someone out there just as wonderful for you. Thanks for listening to me for so long. I hope you find it interesting. I loved it. We talked for a little over two hours. Wow. Hope you edit that down a bit. People are going to dive bored and. Special thank you to Chris and Jane. Thank you both so much for allowing me to interview you for hours and share your story. A big, big thank you to Chris Collins for letting me feature many tracks from his album, Indie Music Box. In addition, there were two other tracks used today, one called The Tourist by the band Message to Bears on the album Maps, and one called Ganymede by Random Rab from the album Awoke. To see photos from Jane and Chris's three weddings, as well as to find links to the music featured on today's episode, visit ColleenLindell.com. As always, if anyone has a question, comment, or concern, or maybe a suggestion of someone I should interview, you can send me a note on Twitter at Colleen Lindell, or an email at MostlyMinutia at gmail.com, or you can also send me a note through my website, ColleenLindell.com. I really do appreciate you listening, and your words and thoughts are very encouraging to me. Thank you. This episode was recorded on location in Seal Beach in Newport Beach, California.